Okay, take your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 15 here this evening. If you could go there with me. Like Pastor said, it's good to see a number of you back that were struggling yesterday because of the storm. I told Brother Trevon, I don't know who all here would be Houston Texan fans, but after yesterday, at least you're still getting touchdowns in your state. <laughs> Where I come from, we've given up touchdowns for quite a few weeks because <laughs> we stunk last year. But anyways, uh, we're in Luke chapter 15 here tonight. If you were here uh, last night in the service, this passage that we're going to uh, look at really is a continuation in some ways of some truth we were looking at last night. If you were not here last night, uh, I would encourage you, if at all possible, I'm not sure when it's going to be able to get uploaded with some of the uh, internet difficulties, but if you're able to, please try to go back and listen to, to the message last night, because really, if I could put a a burden, or if pastor could put a burden for this church in a nutshell, uh, it, would been, it would have been last night's message. And so I would just encourage you, uh, it is a liberating truth, what we looked at last night. And, and the, what we dealt with last night is dealing with the essence of who Christ is and that God is a pursuing Father, constantly, at all times. He does not take a break from it. He doesn't uh, do it for some people and not for others. I was talking with someone here just a minute ago before the service. If you are honest with the text, he was even pursuing Judas. Amen. In the handing of the sop to Judas, he was indicating, I still consider you my friend. He called him friend in the garden. And so there is no one that Christ will not pursue. It is, it is his will that no man would perish. In. And so here, we're here in Luke chapter 15 this evening. This is a trilogy of parables that Jesus gives to his disciples. And, and uh, the, the parables are really all driving at the exact same point. The first parable is the parable of the lost sheep. The, ne the next one is the parable of the lost coins. And the third one is the parable of the lost son. Now in the parable of the lost sheep, what is happening in that text? You've got a hundred sheep. And one is lost. And so the shepherd sets 99 aside in a safe place and he pursues the one until he finds it. Again, it's dealing with, that's what we were walking through last night. The shepherd didn't cut his losses and neither does Jesus. The parable of the lost coins, a woman, she has 10 coins and she loses one. She sets the nine aside, though they're very valuable, but she sets them aside in a safe place so she can go and pursue the one until she finds it. Again, proving, driving home the point, and he's, that's what he's doing through these parables is that he will pursue his sheep. And, and as we come to verse 11, here we have the parable of the lost son. Now, in this parable, there, there's so much to it. And, of course, of the three, it's, it's, the, it's the longest of the three. And really, which we're not going to deal with this tonight, but really much of the thrust of this parable is Jesus is dealing with the self-righteousness of the Pharisees. If you would look at the second half of the parable, which we're not going to get to tonight, uh, in dealing with the older brother, that is one of the driving points of the parable, and that's what convicts the Pharisees. And, uh, again, we're not going to deal with that here this evening. But the first half of the parable is also communicating pursuit, is it not? The boy who goes wayward and the father pursues him. And I, I, we're going to read it here in just a moment. But also, and this is what we're going to be dealing with here this, this evening, this text also gives us another understanding into another attribute of God, and that is, he is a forgiving God. Forgiveness, as we said last night, is not just what he does. It's who he is. We need to get that bedrock in our soul because, as we are going to look at here this evening, too often we find ourselves taking Christ's forgiveness for minor offenses, but running for days because we feel great offenses cannot be forgiven until we prove our worth or worthiness of being forgiven, and we have a very warped view of who our God is. And so tonight I want to try to, as best we can, using this text, adjust our thinking on who our Father is. Let me start with just a brief illustration before we read this text. Uh, a couple years ago, when my wife and I still had an apartment back in, in the Milwaukee area, uh, there was a guy that I was trying to reach out to, and, and uh, he had just moved in. I hadn't had a chance to meet with him. We pulled into the parking lot of, our, of the uh, apartment building, and this guy pulled in right behind us. And it's a guy I wanted to minister to, so I ran out there and said, Hey, what's, you know, what's your name? We, start, we, we hit it off. We're talking. It's very friendly, and, and we quickly get onto the topic of spiritual things. And he says, Well, I'm, I'm trying to be a Muslim. He's trying to practice Islam. And I said, Oh, okay. And so we, we're talking, and 
And, he, and this is the, what he said. He said, really, he said, your God and my God are the same God. Now, I knew, that's not, I knew that wasn't true. I think we all know that, that that is not true. But at the time, I was stumped in the conversation, and I wasn't sure how to explain my way out of that other than to say, no, that can't be. And the conversation really kind of stagnated not long after that. And, and afterwards, I was thinking to myself, I know that's true. I mean, that's obviously not true, but why is that not true? And I began to consider, logically, it can't be true. His God is a God of violence. My God is a God of peace. His God is a God of uh, performance to be accepted, and my God is a God of unconditional love. His God is uh, all, all about uh, rejecting those who reject you, and yet my God is all about embracing those who reject you. And, and so logically, it is impossible that we have the same God. Are, are you tracking with me? So in the same way, imagine with me if that man had come to me and said, Hey, brother, or, or Caleb, he said, I, I saw your dad last week. And I would say, that's not possible. My dad lives on the East Coast. He says, no, I saw your dad. And I would say to him, well, describe my dad to me. And he would say, well, uh, he, you know, six foot two, he's pretty large. He's got some good sized pecs and ab, you know, six pack and uh, graying hair, wears glasses, full beard. And I'd say, well, my dad's five foot eight. My dad has a little bit of a belly. He does not have six-pack eggs. I mean, I can tell you that. He does wear glasses and has gray hair, but he does not have a beard. And so clearly, he and I would both conclude who you thought my dad was and who my dad is are not the same person. Correct? Such, in the same way that I look at his Allah and my God and I say who you think your God is and who my God is are not the same person. So in the same way, many Christians get a, in their mind, and in, in our mind, and our thinking, we get an idea of who God is, especially when it comes to the matter of forgiveness, and who we think God is, and who God is, are two different people. What I want to do tonight is introduce you to a forgiving God. Look with me in verse 11 as Jesus begins this parable, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and, and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck, neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Lord Jesus, I ask that in these moments that we have here tonight, Lord, would you open our understanding Lord, through this text, through the questions that are asked, Spirit of God, I ask that you would shape our thinking, Lord, that you would confront us with wrong thinking, Lord, that you would, if there are those in the congregation here tonight that are struggling with this issue, Spirit of God, with, with your directness, I ask that you would pinpoint them, that, Lord, tonight our, our thinking would be changed, our heart would be softened, and we would come back to thee who is a forgiving God. And so now, Lord, we are looking for your presence and we are looking for your power. We give the glory to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. This account is often called the story of the prodigal son. We've all heard that. And oftentimes we'll hear that phrase used in our common vernacular. 
someone comes home who's been gone for a long way, or whether in jest or serious, we will say, here comes the prodigal. And this story, is, is, is that's what this is named for. Could I ask you, though, does anyone here know what the definition of the word prodigal is? We use it a lot, but do you know what the word means? Anybody want to give a guess? We use it, so if, you, if you've used it, you think you know what it means, so, so out, throw out a definition. Someone throw out a definition, and I do know a few people's names, so I can call on you if, uh, if you don't volunteer right away. Okay, yes, brother. Okay, how many of you think it means wayward? Couple brave souls. The way we use the word, that's what we would how we would define it, but it actually doesn't mean wayward. Anybody else? Okay, sometimes we would define it be a lost. Some people would say, I think it means lost. The prodigal does not mean lost. Prodigal, the word prodigal actually means lavish or excessive. So, to put it in, our, in, a, in a sentence, it would be like if we went over to the Crips house and Miss Sonia made a, 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 a pie, say an apple pie, and she set the piece of apple pie in front of me, and she took that whipped cream, and she... <laughs> I'd say, bless your soul. <laughs> but I would say, Miss Sonia, you were prodigal with the cream, right? Now, that's not a bad thing to be excessive, but the idea there is that she is putting lavishly on that piece of pie, whether it was needed or not, she, she excessively added that cream. Okay, that's the reason why we think of this story as called the prodigal son is because the boy lavishly spends the wealth. But I believe here we could rename this account the story of the prodigal father. Because in this text you are going to see lavish, excessive forgiveness. Jesus introduces us to this family. You have a father with two boys. The older of the boys, if you know the rest of the parable, is the son who, uh, he, though he may not have the heart of the father, he does right. He's, he's sticking to the stuff. He's consistent. He's, he's got his standards all together, which is what he is basing his entire worth on. Because I've done right and I didn't fail, Dad, so Dad, you should be throwing parties for me. That's his conclusion. But the second son, the younger of the two, comes to his father one day and asks him for quite, a, a, gives a, a, quite a request. Look at verse 12. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. I think probably all of us understand that this is quite a disrespectful request that the boy is asking. Basically... He's coming to him and saying, Dad, you know the wealth that you have earned over your lifetime, the, the wealth that you've worked hard for, uh, the estate that you have finally acquired through your blood, sweat, and tears, Dad, the inheritance that's coming to me as a rightful son when you croak, I don't have time to wait for that. I want my money now. It would be, there, there was a, uh, a pastor that I know that lives in Minnesota. He has a large family, all grown and gone. One of the boys is estranged from his father. The pastor, this man goes on uh, bi-yearly, bi-annually, he'll go to, a, uh, go to Canada, go on a fishing trip. Not long ago, his son called him and said, Dad, I've heard you've been taking fishing trips to Canada. You need to cut it out. You're spending my inheritance. It is that kind of attitude that this boy is coming to his father. So let me ask you, as I asked you last night, if you were the father of the prodigal son, and your son comes to you and says, hey dad, I want the money, what would you do? I'd say, not, 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 no, <laughs> not on your life, no chance. Mm -hmm. Do you think the, the, the father was surprised by his son's request? Now we, we're, we're, we're surmising here because Jesus only gives us what we read, but if this is a, a normal family, if this boy is of age, and it certainly seems like he would be of age because he's going to go down to the red light district and the bars and the boozing and he's going to do it all. So he's probably 18 in our culture or 21 in our culture. So let's just say he's 21. So he's clearly a grown man. He's of age. He can leave home. So the father has had 21 years. We're just guessing there. The father has had 21 years to... Uh, notice how this boy, his, what his character is like. When, when the boy comes to dad and says, hey dad, I want the money now, dad is not like, oh my goodness, I didn't know you were so disrespectful. 
I didn't know you were lazy. I didn't know you had such poor character. No, the dad full well knows he's been watching him for the last 10 years. He's been watching him grow up in his home. He watches him when he sloughs off in the field. He watches him when he doesn't uh, carry his weight. He watches uh, when, when, when he makes unethical decisions. And dad knows this boy wants the money and I know what he's going to do with it. I don't think dad was surprised at all. Dad knows the character of the boy. He has a, a disrespectful request. And what does the father do? I find this fascinating. He chooses to give him the inheritance. This whole parable is about our Heavenly Father. Like we looked at last night, we talked about the fact that when Jonah was running, and he's swallowed by the whale, and to Jonah, I'm sure that seemed like uh, the next step before death, and yet it was the pursuit of God. I do believe that the Heavenly Father knew or knows for us what we need. And this father knew that giving the inheritance to the boy was necessary if he was ever going to return home. And he not only gives him the inheritance, but I believe this father gave him the inheritance full well intending, I will take him back after he blows it. And the boy takes the money, and as is his M.O., he takes it and runs. Look at verse 13. And not many days after... The younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. No surprise here. He's doing what he's been doing for the last 10 years. This is the way the boy is. You give him an opportunity to fail and he will fail. That's what he is doing. Dad's not surprised. There he is, wastes his money. Verse 14, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want, or he, he's lacking, he's run out of funds, he can no longer uh, supply his lifestyle. Verse 15, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he, the citizen, sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. So here you see this boy, this arrogant boy, he's taking the inheritance of dad disrespectfully. And I'm sure that when he left home, he has no con concern or care for the tear that is trickling down the father's uh, face. As the boy leaves home, all he is thinking about is his own selfish pursuits. And when he gets to the next town or wherever it is, the far country, and after he spends everything and runs out of money, he's not yet ready to humble himself. He must go farther. He must go deeper. And so there the famine begins. And running out of money, he goes and gets a job trying to supply and continue his lifestyle. But it gets so bad that this Palestinian Jewish boy comes to the conclusion that swine are living better than he. And finally, in verse 17, which is the phrase I'm sure many mothers have prayed throughout the years. The scripture says, and when he came to himself... Finally, it dawned on him. The pit that he was in, the filth that he was in, finally got to him. His eyes were opened. His conscience was pricked. He's beginning to realize because the pressure was increased, he comes to the conclusion, what am I doing? Church family, when we read verse 17, we see that phrase, and when he came to himself, we rejoice because we know what that means. Keep in mind, if there has been someone like we talked last night that you've been praying for for some time who is wayward they need to get to that point and in your prayers for them you can ask the Lord Lord bring them to the pig pen not so that they would wallow and I get to lord it over them so that they would come to themselves and here's the boy finally realizing the state he is in notice what he concludes and when he came to himself he said how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare and i he, being a son perish with hunger and so here's his conclusion i will arise and I will go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. This is what the boy concludes. He realizes, man, the, my, back on my dad's estate, there are the servants, the hired people, the ones that I used to boss around. Those people are living better than I, who am an heir to my father, although, although I spent it all. They're living better than I'm living. 
And his conclusion is, I'm so filthy, I'm so dirty, I'm so unworthy because of what I have done to my father's inheritance that my father would never take me back as a son. I'm not worthy to be called a son, but maybe I could be a second class citizen. Maybe I could be a servant. So his conclusion is, there's no way dad would accept me back as in my sonship, but maybe he's good enough to take me back as his slave. So he had a partially right understanding of his father. He remembered the goodness of his father, but he did not know the forgiveness of his father. Isn't it true that's how often we are? We think to ourselves, I, I, I've not gotten to the extremes that some people have. And I know I'm a child of God, but I've blown it so bad. I cannot be restored to what I used to be. I can't be as effective as I could have been. He wouldn't take me back like I think I wish I could be, but maybe I can at least take second class status. And in this mindset, he genuinely, I believe, sincerely comes back to his father. And as he is making his way back there, as he's, he's walking on the dusty roads heading home, he's rehearsing his confession. I'll say to my father, Father, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Do you see him as he's walking back? If you've ever had to go confess something to your parents, you know what it's like to rehearse your confession. <laughs> I've been there. Okay, I need to say it this way and this way and I better, I better get to the consequences fast before he gets a chance to inflict consequences on me. And what are his consequences? I, I, I have to be a servant. And so as the boy is making his way back, look at what the text says, and, and, and what a glorious passage here. Uh, verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Let that sink in. He smells like pigs. He's the, he's the son that has spent half of my estate and he's on his way back. And if, if, if this father was like how we parent, we would be sitting on the front step saying, Oh, ho, the prodigal has returned. <laughs> Grovel, buddy. Can I say, told you so. But God the Father, illustrated in this passage, does not do that. The father's, in fact, on the front porch looking for him. The scripture doesn't say if he's been looking every day, but I imagine understanding a father's love that this father has been longing for quite some time. And he's been looking, and maybe he's looking every day, maybe several times a day, but there comes a day when he cresting over the hill, he recognizes that gate. I've seen that figure before. I recognize, and that's my boy. And he takes off running. Now to us who we value athleticism and being in shape when you're old, that's like, hey, good, get your mile in. But in Palestine, that would have been very much below a man of any kind of class or dignity. But the father's not worried about his reputation. He's taking after his boy. And he takes off running. And as he runs up to the boy, notice how far the boy gets into his confession. The boy begins to confess, Father, Father, I, I've sinned against heaven and before you and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And that's as far as dad lets him go. He never allows him to get to the consequences. Immediately the father takes him and calls to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. He didn't ask for the one that was tattered. He didn't ask for the second class one. He said, I want the best one. And I want a ring and I want shoes and kill the fatted calf. My son used to be dead and now he's alive. Church family, that is the lavish forgiveness of your father. Now, if you're cynical here, you might think to yourself, okay, he did that once, but I bet if that boy ran away, he wouldn't do it twice. But scripture actually gives us the heart of Christ in Psalm 86, 5. It says, for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Nehemiah 9, 17, thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. 
See, the Bible is describing and illustrated in this parable. The Bible is telling us that the Father, it is not that he will forgive sometimes or as you blow it once and I'll forgive you this time, but you blow it twice and I'm not going to be fooled. That's not who he is. The scripture is revealing to us that he is a father who is constantly on guard, ready to forgive. In other words, it's his knee-jerk reaction. You give him the opportunity and he's longing for the chance to forgive because forgiveness is who he is. Uh, imagine with me tonight, and I'm going to use the Hewlin family. They're guests here, uh, friends of mine from Houston. But this, this helps me because we have a row of five ladies. Imagine with me if in this back door here, while the service was going on, a snake slithered in here. And everybody here is paying attention to the service and, and the snake comes right down the center aisle and starts to make his way across all the ladies' feet. <laughs> Let me ask you, ladies, what would you do if, if you look down and you see a snake going across your feet, what would you do? <laughs> would you think about it? Would, would you, you, she, she screamed. Would anybody else scream? <laughs> Come on, Trevon, would you scream? <laughs> okay, I would. <laughs> would you think about it? Would, would you sit there and think, now this might disrupt the service. I don't know if this is wise. Would you think about it? No. You would just scream. Okay, would you, what would you do? You would do the same thing? Okay. Mrs. Hewlin, what would you do? I'd jump up, you jump up on the chair. Okay, would anybody else jump on the chair? Okay. Now, now consider this, and I'm not, trying to be, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but because they're girls, who they are comes out, right? In a moment, their nature is revealed because when they see a snake, they don't even help themselves, they're getting out of the way. It's their, it's their reaction. It would, it would be like uh, uh, if, if, if a mother, if one of the ladies here was outside in the parking lot and my little son ran out into the parking lot and ran out into the road. Would any mother in this room start thinking, now I did not bear him. He's not mine. I'm not even going to get any of the benefits from his life insurance. Would, no, no mother would think that. Any mother, if she sees a little child running out into the road, you know what she would do? Instinctively, because her essence is a mother, who she is is going to come out. This is who my father is. He is forgiveness. Instinctively. The purpose he came. We have the old song that Jesus was born to die upon Calvary. His purpose for coming, the reason he was brought to this earth was for the purpose of forgiveness. So there is never a time in a Christian's life when we get to the point when we are no longer forgivable. I quoted it last night, but Jesus tells the Pharisees, I've not come to call the righteous, I've come to call sinners, which means when he came on his task of forgiveness, he knew what he was getting into. He knew I'm coming for the purpose of forgiveness. One of the greatest verses that anyone, anyone can quote on forgiveness is 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He, it's telling us something about God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You know what that verse is telling us? Two things faithful and just. In uh, Yellowstone or Yosemite, there is a geyser. Which one is it? Old Faithful? Yellowstone? In Yellowstone, there is a geyser called Old Faithful. Anybody seen it? Anybody been there? A few. Okay, I've not seen it. I've seen videos. From what I have read online, unsaved atheistic scientists have set a clock uh, beside Yellowstone, or at least they, ca they could, but beside that geyser, and they can monitor within seconds of when that geyser will go off consistently year after year after year, and that's why they've called it Old Faithful. Church family, when it comes to forgiveness... Your father is more consistent. You can set your clock by him. You can know that when I ask, he will forgive. But Jesus, does, or the, uh, in, there in 1 John, he doesn't just say he's faithful. He also says he's just, which means it's been paid for. So therefore, justice demands you receive forgiveness. It, it would be like, and this has happened to us before, uh, if we came into the beginning of this uh, revival meeting 
And let's just say there was a, a family, let's just say Brother Buck, and they came to Pastor and they said, boy, Pastor, we, we'd like to take the reeds out for lunch, but our schedule does not allow. Here's, you know, here's $35. Can you give this to the reeds so that they can go out for lunch on Tuesday? Okay, this happens sometimes at meetings we're in. And so let's just say Brother Buck gives that to Pastor on Saturday before the meeting. And so Pastor puts that in his, in his in pocket and says, okay, I'm, I'm going to give that to the reeds. It's designated funds for the reeds for Tuesday's lunch. Well, let's just say Pastor forgets and Tuesday comes and and uh, I don't know what we're going to do for lunch. So Emma and I, we jump in the truck and we take the kids. And let's just say we run down to Chick-fil-A and, and we really go to town there, get some you know, sandwiches, fries, and maybe even a shake. And it comes out to $35. We drive back into the parking lot. And as pastor sees us pulling into the parking lot, he says, Oh, God, I had that money for them. And he runs up to the window and I roll the window down and, and he says, Brother, did you guys just go out for lunch? And I say, Oh, yeah, yes, pastor, we did. Oh, okay. Well, I guess you don't need to have the money then. Would pastor do that? No, it wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be ethical. What pastor would do is he'd say, Brother Reed, I am so sorry. And he would take the $35 out and he would say, Brother Reed, you, you need to take this. And I would say, no, 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 pastor, it's okay. We already paid for lunch. And he would say, no, somebody already paid for your lunch. You must have it. Ethics, justice demands you receive it. So in the same way, when we come to the Father needing forgiveness, Jesus, our advocate, is saying, even if there was ever a chance that God wouldn't want to give it to us, which we know he would, but our advocate is saying, no, 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 my blood demands they be forgiven. For how much? All of it. So like when Trevon was up here last night, we used that illustration. He finds himself feeling very far from God from the decisions of disobedience that he swore he'd never go back. And now he has found himself in those. The kind of sin that when you confess it to your family or confess it to your wife, confess it to your husband, it shakes the entire marriage. Those kind of sins, God says, even those, I paid for them. And he's not pleading for us to get our act together to prove to him we won't do it again before he issues the forgiveness. He gives it upon the receiving. Notice the father is not down at the butcher shop. The boy doesn't have to come and say, hey, has anybody seen dad? Does anybody know where he is? Yeah, I think he's down at the butcher shop. And he goes down there and, hey, has anybody seen dad? Oh, yeah, he's over there if you want to see him. No, it's the father running to the son. And so he is for you. Have you ever heard the phrase, uh, we're going to find out what you're made of? You ever heard that phrase? Sometimes maybe you'll hear it in a sporting context, whether it be on the football field or basketball field. And usually it's used when you're getting down to the, to the last few minutes, maybe the end of that fourth quarter. You're, you're burned, you're exhausted, and the game's on the line, and, 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 and you've, you've put it all in the field, but the coach is asking you, come on, man, pull through. Show them what you're made of. The idea is that when you've exhausted all of your resources, you need to go a little bit farther and find out, do you have what it takes? Sometimes you'll hear that phrase in military training. Pastor, did you ever hear that when you were in boot camp? Okay. Uh, I, I, I've, I've never been in the military, but have read some books about Navy SEAL training. And certainly when it comes to Navy SEAL training, that's what they're trying to do. Whether it be Navy SEALs, Green Berets, whatever your special forces are, they're going to take uh, their, their raw recruits from whatever branch and they're going to take them in there and and they're going to weed through them and they're going to take, especially the Navy SEALs, they'll take about 100 at a time. And they'll put those 100 into their, uh, their, their Navy SEAL training there. And, and the attrition rate, the fallout rate of 100 is going to be about 82%. And part of that is by design. What the officers are doing there at Coronado Beach, especially during the week of training called Hell Week, is their design is we want to weed out the boys that are here for the uniform. We want to weed out the boys who are here for the free drinks and the easy girls. We are looking for the guys that when everything is stripped away and when pain has been inflicted and you have no other reason to continue, we want to find out, are you, do you have what it takes to be a Navy SEAL? So it's what they do. They strip them of sleep, sleep deprivation, food, comfort. They're putting them in the 50 degree ocean, getting wet and sandy, running, incredible pain. You fall and break a bone, they're going to still push you because they want to know what you're made of. When we see Christ hanging on the cross, everything's been stripped away. There's no more place for comfort. Pain 
has been inflicted. His closest friends have run. His father has turned his back on him. He's stripped naked because that was the position of shame. And there after six hours with nothing to hold him there but love, we find out what even Christ is made of. And you know what pours forth? Father, forgive them. You cannot walk out of the service tonight concluding that Jesus is anything but forgiveness. If I can put it this way, his blood drips forgiveness. It shouts forgiveness. And for me and for you to hold out 24 or 48 hours before we go to Jesus to try to make sure we are in a condition that is worthy to be forgiven. We are taking his blood and slapping it back in his face. Because he is saying, I came to forgive sinners. I'm, I'm just, the illustration we use, if you weren't here last night, but with Trevon up here, if you were here, what, I'm, what I want to use in that illustration is that every person, could, Trevon, could you just come back up here real, real fast? I'm sorry, buddy, I didn't warn you. And we won't rework the illustration, but, but in essence, we often find ourselves walking away from God. And go ahead and turn, turn around, Trevon. And if God is a pursuing God like we dealt with last night, then he in every step of disobedience we make, he is there right behind us. And what the, the purpose that he is right here for is that when we would humble ourselves, we can take, receive immediate forgiveness. Immediate. And, and you, can, you can know, church family, that he's not sitting here going, fine, you can have it. That's not his heart. He's saying, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Please come, please take it. I want to give it. It's who I am. And so when we humble ourselves, thank you, Trevon, in that moment, we can receive the essence of Christ. Forgiveness. But maybe here as we close, you might find yourself in a position where you aren't struggling to receive the forgiveness. Maybe you're struggling to give the forgiveness. In Ephesians 4, 31, you don't need to turn there. But listen to this scripture. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. It's very hard to forgive someone for my sake, is it not? But that's not what Jesus asked for me to do. He said, forgive them for my sake. What that means is if he is a forgiving God, then on the cross he paid for the penalties. He paid, paid the penalty of the, uh, the grievances, the sins of the person who offended me. So when I am in a position where I have been hurt and someone has uh, said something to me that has cut me deeply, and I'm struggling with that bitterness that, that wants to flow forth. And when I am in that position struggling because I have been wronged and, and I know I need to forgive, but I find no power in me, we find ourselves going, Jesus, I can't forgive. You tell me to forgive, but how can I forgive? You don't know what they've done to me. To which Christ turns his scarred hands to us and says I've forgiven them so for my sake would you as well for my sake which means church family the person who you are harboring bitterness towards low level resentment the person that you just can't stand to see them or whenever they speak they irritate you that person Jesus is saying, I've already forgiven them. Whether they've come and, and received it of me, that's between them. But you know, when it comes to God's perspective, he's saying, I have come to the place where I've forgiven them. And so therefore, if I've forgiven them, who do I think I am for holding out over Jesus? He says, for Christ's sake, as God hath forgiven you, so also do you. 
I think sometimes the reason that we struggle to give forgiveness is because we think we are better Christians and we have forgotten how much we've been forgiven. In church family, if we could get into our hearts, if we would be reminded of the constant pursuing forgiveness of our God for us, it should and would compel us then by God's grace to then give that same forgiveness to the one who has wronged me. Forgiveness. It's not just what God does, it's who he is. I'll finish with this quote. A Puritan from years gone by once said, we have this for our foundation truth, that there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. There is more forgiveness flowing from Jesus than I could ever match with my sin. There is more mercy flowing from Christ for my offender than he could ever offend me over. So would we tonight begin the process of taking and giving Christ's forgiveness?